This is the third in the series of messages on watchfulness. Today's message is on watchful saints. And we'll be reading again, first of all, from Mark 13. This has been our jump off text in all three of the messages. And so follow along as I read verses 31 through 37. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Now again, some general statements about the messages that you've heard already on watchful women and watchful watchmen. Though we're told many times, we, we need to continue to be told that it's kept at the forefront of our mind, that it is an, uh, an anchor pin in our heart, that the Word of God will not pass away. Jesus had just told the disciples some pretty incredible things that were going to happen to the temple and to the Jews as a nation, to Israel as a nation, to the Jewish system of worship, and it had become quite a grand and quite a glorious thing. Uh, it had become big business to a number of them, as evidenced by the Lord's cleansing of the temple. Not once, but twice, he drove the money changers and the merchandisers out. So this stirred a curiosity in the disciples, something so drastic and so shocking, and they said, well, when is this going to happen? And we look at our life uh, here, we look at our country, we've got quite a fantastic country. We've become in a little over 200 years, and much of that happening just at the tail end, just in that last 100 years, much of our greatness has developed. And the idea of it coming to an end to us is a fantastic one that we could cease to be a world power, that we could cease to be a leader in world economy, that we could cease to be a leader in the, in the, in the world in what, what is right and what is good, and that the American dream would just disappear like a puff of smoke. Uh, it is disappearing. We're changing, and it's a fantastic idea to us. But Jesus reminds the disciples in his day, what I'm telling you will not pass away. It will all come to pass. And so he tells them to watch. And he gives them an example of a man who went on a far journey. He said, now the Son of Man, that's me, I'm like another man who went on a far journey. I'm going to be going away, and I'm going to be doing certain things there. He told him in one other place, when I go away, I'm going to be preparing a place for you, and then I'll come back and get you. I'm going to receive a kingdom for myself. I mean, there are things happening relative to the Son of, of God in heaven as he's gone away. But then he said, that time's going to come to an end, and I'm going to come back. And then other things are going to happen. Now he says, in the meantime, I've given to all the servants of the household everything that they're going to need in order to live from day to day and to function. And I gave to, to, I'll give to all of them their business. And I'm giving authority to those that need authority to whatever degree in order to get the work done. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to do a job that you haven't been given the tools and the authority to do. If you've been, ever been in that situation, it is a miserable situation to be in. But Jesus said, I've not left my household in such an order. And then he commanded the porter to watch. That is to guard, to protect. Not only things that come in that would affect the household in a, in a bad way, but to see that the things that need to come in in order to strengthen the household come in, but also to guard what goes out, that the householder not suffer loss. There are certain things as Christians that we are to hold to ourselves and not let them be changed, not let them be stolen, altered, diminished, diluted, taken away. These uh, responsibilities fall to uh, whomever is the porter of the house, the porter of the gate. And Jesus commanded him to watch. And so there's some implied threats there. There are threats from without that the people would face. But there's also one other, I'll use the word threat, because it was a situation that they were told to avoid. Lest when the householder come back, he find you sleeping something to be avoided. And because we're warned about it, it's a threat to us. It poses a danger to us, and so we're being cautioned and warned about it. And Jesus sums this up in verse 37. What I'm saying to you, 
This isn't just for you disciples here. This isn't just for you who will be my apostles. What I'm saying to you, I'm saying it to all. Watch. We must watch. And so during this, this message here, this morning, try to keep from thinking of another person. Try to keep of thinking from some other church, some other uh, saint, some other situation somewhere else, thinking, you know, so-and-so really needs to uh, hear this and, and uh, uh, this ministry and that ministry and whatever. Uh, make a personal application. Realize that just as Jesus said to the disciples, he's saying this to each of us this morning. Now you watch. Lest we be found sleeping. Now, Webster's defines sleep as a periodic suspension of consciousness during which the powers of the body are restored. We go from, from one state of consciousness to another because we know that much can happen when we're sleeping. If you have an active dream life, boy, you can wake up more tired than you went to bed. And so this sleeping that is talked about here is going from awareness of one state of living or one state of existing or being to another state, awake to sleeping, conscious to subconscious. Sleeping spiritually is having a greater focus and a greater emphasis on life in the flesh than we do on life in the spirit. That is to be sleeping because the person who's spiritually sleeping can be quite active and quite busy. We saw that Wednesday night when Jesus began to speak to the church of Ephesus. He said, man, I know your labors, I know your work, you've been busy, you've born, you've had, pa you know, had patience, you, you've been consistent, persistent, but he said, now I have this against you. You left your first love. And so to be caught sleeping spiritually is to be in a distracted state. If somebody is physically sleeping and there are things going on around them and they're not aware of that, well, that's only right and that's only natural. But to be so spiritually is something we're warned against, to not be aware of what we're supposed to be aware of. A distracted, distractedness, and it's important because one of the scriptures we looked at last week was in Ephesians 4, that God has provided within this household, within the church, the house of God, he's provided ministers. And the ministers are, are to work for the perfecting of the saints, that is, helping them grow up and mature, come to completeness in Christ, for the work of the ministry. And, and then the, the Bible says that we be no more children tossed to and fro by the winds of doctrine, by the slight of men. You ever see anybody do magic tricks with their hands, balls and cards and things like that? You can get, there's nothing occult about some of that. It's just, it's just sleight of hand. It's distraction. You get them looking at one hand while you're doing something with another hand. And the people who practice at it are very good at it. And the Bible says that God has given ministers within the church to keep the saints from falling prey to the slight of men, being distracted, having somebody get our attention doing one thing over here while the important work is going on over here that we should be paying attention to. This is where some of the watchmen have cried wolf too often in the past. One problem is blaming the devil for too little and the other is blaming the devil for too much. When we get into the habit of, of thinking that the devil's responsible for everything and, and we're running off over here and we're running off over there and you get everybody excited going in that direction about it instead of minding things at home. While we're out marching around the community, the devil's in there just tearing our home to pieces. And the Bible calls it cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And that cunning craftiness means all using. It means that Satan particularly can use any means. He'll use any device, any trick, any circumstance, any lie, any truth, any good, any bad. He'll use anything that he can specific to the situation to accomplish what he wants to do. But the Bible assures us that despite all that craft, despite all that cunning, that we can be awake and protected by being wakeful and watchful. Hallelujah. And so we must watch. Guard against sleeping, a spiritual distractedness by having the things of life loom up too big in our eyes and in our heart, in our emotions. The Bible tells us why we have to be watchful. Not just that, well, we have to be watchful because we're told to be watchful. Yes, that's true. But there's some specific reasons why, and, and that points us to the areas of watchfulness. One of them we find in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. We must be watchful because the way to eternal life is narrow. Jesus said in Matthew 7:13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, 
For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now a straight gate or a straight way is a narrow way, but it doesn't, when we're talking about a way now, a way has some, some duration to it. It's not just a doorway you go through and boom, you're there. There is a straight gate. It's a narrow gate, but there's also a narrow way, a straight way. Now that way is not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, -T, straight, where you can stand at one end and see the light of the tunnel all the way to the other. There's some tunnels, I think the Whittier Tunnel is like that, and if it's not properly lit, you drive in there, all of a sudden you take a turn, you can't see. There's a curve, you can't see the light at the other end. It's easy to get disoriented, even a little anxious over that. And so you reach down, you pop the lights on, and you hit the high beams so you're sure to see everything. You do that because there's a wall on either side. There's bounds on either side. And so the straight way is not just a way that you can stand at the beginning and you can see the light all the way through at the end and there's absolutely a clear shot. It's a way that is made narrow because of obstacles that are lying close on either side. It's a nautical term. That's what Jesus said, the straight gate, the narrow way is, the straight way. And so we're told to enter into that gate. It's the only one that leads to life. The other one leads to destruction. Now, the fact that the way is straight, the gate is straight and narrow, that's not God's fault. The fact that there are obstacles to believing, there are obstacles to faith, there are obstacles to walking in the Spirit, the fact that there are obstacles lying close on either side is not God's fault. He didn't make it that way. We did. We are the ones who have brought corruption into the environment. We're the ones. By men, sin has come into the world. And by men, it's flourished. And it's now become technological. And we find it on every hand. We find temptation to the flesh on every hand, close by, on every side. And we must be careful. And that is not God's fault. We must give glory to God that God has at least made a way. Amen? With all these obstacles, with all these chances for shipwreck, with the rocks to go up on and the submerged, you know, the sandbars and the, the snags and the things to rip the hull out of your boat, to tear your rudder off so that you have, lose direction, with all these obstacles seen and unseen around, we must be thankful that God has at least made a way. And then he's told us how we can safely navigate that way if we'll be watchful. And a person who understands that they're in such a way of passage, which is what a straight is, they're constantly watching. They're on their guard. Even though, even though they might have gone that way before, even though they've got a map, they're familiar with the passage, they're still watchful. They keep their eye on where they're going. And I think to hide this truth, that there are perils facing even the Christian, as the Christian walks the Christian way, that they must be on guard against, to hide that truth, to tell the saints of God that you have no need, not only not to fear, but don't even be concerned with these things in your life, is to imperil souls. Then this is what the false prophets do. Mislead, misguide, misdirect. And so we must be watchful because the way to eternal life is straight. There are obstacles on either side that we must be aware of in this life that we live. Secondly, we must be watchful, each of us, because each of us has an adversary to our soul. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. You know, when Jesus said to watch, tune yourself to, to be aware of certain words in the scripture. For instance, the word beware, that's a watch word. Be sober, that's a watch word, it means pay attention. The word be vigilant is a watch word. Be diligent, that's a watch word. And so we're told in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, be watchful, be attentive, don't be distracted, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You say, well, the saints have no, no fear there. That's something we, we don't even have to be concerned about that. Well, let's go to the scriptures and see if that's true. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 to 34, we find this example played out specifically with Jesus and Simon Peter. The Bible tells us that we have, here's Peter talking, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, the man who wrote that is going to tell us about his own experience. Or rather, Luke is. We're going to be told about Peter's experience. 
In Luke 22, verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both unto prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. He would, and Jesus could see it, because Jesus could see in Peter. He could see the state of Peter's heart and Peter's mind, and yet Peter thought he was ready. He said, I'm ready. Let him come. Bring it on. We hear that kind of tough and stupid and foolish talk today. Let's go out and kick some devil butt. You know, bring it on, devil. And people wanting to teach other people to have that kind of an attitude. We've got to draw back from some of the charismania that is crippling the church and blinding the church and weakening the church. Their extremes, their excesses, and their errors. We need to pull back from some of that. Peter said, I'm ready. I'll go to prison. I'll even go to death. Satan sought Simon, the Bible said, to sift him like wheat. I worked in a flour mill, PV flour mill in my hometown. Sifting wheat's a remarkable process. You know when that wheat first comes in, it goes through something called a hammer mill. And that hammer mill is loud and jarring and it shakes. It does just what the name says. It's a hammer mill and it's meant to separate, to bounce up the lighter wheat and sticks and some of the chaff from the heavier metal, the bolts and the steel and things that get into the wheat in the process of either planting or harvesting, transporting. And so the hammer mill will shake a lot of that out of there. But the wheat's not done. In the section of the mill, we had 10 floors, and, and the entire 10 floors were used in this process of wheat. The wheat came in after it was tempered, after its moisture content was brought to where it, it needed to be in order to be milled properly. So when it's brought into the mill, it goes on a shaker table. And that shaker table is a slanted thing with a, with a, a paddle on it, and it just shakes like this. <laughs> And the wheat comes down, and the paddle is, so you set the paddle by, by hand, and, and you just visually eyeball where the wheat begins to separate from the lighter sticks and, and the rest of the, the, the chaff and, and leaves and twigs, whatever else is in there. And so you set that paddle to catch the wheat, and then the other goes off into the, into the trash. And so when that's done, it goes through its first milling. And the, the uh, first milling... The mill wheels, the mill stones, they use steel wheels there, but they're, they're very coarse. And they're meant to crack that exterior of the wheat. And so it goes through two, three, four steps, and it goes down the floors. And then it's shot up the floors again. Once some of the heavier, the outer husks and things are removed, then the lighter part of the wheat is shot up the floor again. And that, then it comes down through sifter boxes. And these are smaller and smaller series of screens. And they're in big boxes, and the wheat comes in through the top of the floor, and it comes into these boxes, and each box has four little compartments in it, but they're big boxes, and they, they just rotate like this. And then the sifted wheat comes out of the bottom, and part of my job at one point was to go in and keep that place clean, because in the process of milling, you create dust, and if you get too much dust in a flour mill, there can be an explosion. And so they'd send us in with these big car wash mitts, and we'd have to put this certain kind of oil on them, and we'd have to go through and wipe these wooden boxes. But you had to keep your perspective all the time because the boxes weren't all rotating at the same speed. And so you're in there, and you're just kind of watching because if you lost perspective of where you were, a box could hit you and then knock you into another box, and pretty soon you're just like a pinball going back and forth in there until you drop. This is the process that... Satan sought to put Peter through. It's a proving process. He had asked for and then granted permission to sift Peter like wheat. Peter said, I'm ready. Let me tell you, I remind myself, none of us in ourselves are ready for Satan's sifting process. He sifted Peter through a series of circumstances where Peter felt his life in jeopardy. The life he'd swore to give up for Jesus just hours before, he now fought desperately to protect, even to the point of denying him. But Satan doesn't always work that way. Remember, he's cunning, he's wily, he'll use whatever device he can. And, and so people today, they might say, well, you know, I count myself to be a good enough person. I think I'm aware enough. I've, I've been raised with some good morals and some good principles, and I believe they'll be able to safely guide me through this. I don't need this religious stuff you're talking about. I think I can do a pretty good job. But you know, when Satan begins that sifting process, and there's so many steps in it, he can slowly lead a, a decent, moral, upright young man or a woman, small step.
by small step to where they're doing things so vile and so wicked and they're not awake to it. It's a process. Jesus said, I've already prayed for you, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. I'll tell you, when we are sifted, we better be looking to God for help. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to look at the scriptures here in just a bit that tell us how ready that help is to our hand. But Jesus said, I've already prayed for him. And Simon said, I'm ready. Bring it on. The gate and the way to eternal life is straight. Obstacles on either side. That speaks much about the environment that we live in. There are a number of things, nearly everything in this worldly life, to stumble up someone who intends to live for God. And so we have a corrupt and a fallen environment. We have a foe, an adversary to our soul that we are to be watchful for. And then Jesus was trying to point out this last thing to be careful of to Peter. We have a very weak flesh. Our flesh is weak. Mark chapter 14, verses 37 through 38. Notice that even though Jesus cautioned Peter, he warned him ahead of time, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you to sift you like wheat, to grind you, to bust you, to shake you, to puff you up and drop you down. And Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. And, and Simon said, I'm ready. And so in Mark 14, verse 37, 38, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, praying in his agony, took Peter, James, and John with him, those three out of all the others, to be with him as he went apart. A distance and he said stay with me and pray my soul my soul is sorrowful and so heavy even unto death and so Jesus went off a short ways even from them and he prayed to his father and then he came back mark 14 we pick it up verse 37 he cometh and he find them sleeping and he said unto Peter Simon sleepest thou couldest thou not watch one hour watch ye and pray he said watch ye and pray lest ye enter into temptation the spirit truly is ready but the flesh is weak. Jesus didn't deny that Peter, within his heart, in his spirit, he felt ready. But he tried to point out to Peter, the flesh is weak. And saints, he points that out to us today. Our flesh is weak. But notice that though Jesus had prayed for him, he also told Peter himself to watch and pray. And so though we have God working on our behalf, as we're going to see from some scripture shortly, for all that God has done on our behalf and is doing for us as saints, as the saved and the redeemed, we still are told to watch and pray. Jesus didn't come and say, Simon, Simon, wake up. Couldn't you even watch with me an hour? Oh, who needs to? You pray, oh, you pray for me already. I'm okay. No, Jesus said, get up. Watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation. Lest the time that now is become a temptation to you that you're not ready to face. You see, the time of trouble is going to come upon the whole world. Jesus said about this time in which they were taking him and were going to arrest him and try him and convict him unjustly and crucify him. He told those that were involved in that process, he said, Behold, this is your hour and the power of darkness. And that hour and the power of darkness will come upon the world again. And the Bible says it's going to come upon the whole world. Right then it only came upon Jesus and his followers. And he told Peter, he said, watch and pray, lest when this time come upon us, when this moment come, and it is coming shortly, you be not ready, and it become a temptation to you. A time of proving that you're not equal to. And so the saints today need to be aware of the same thing. That's the hour that's developing, the time that's coming, that will try all who live upon the face of the earth, lest we find ourselves come to that moment not ready. The same thing that women were told to be on watch for and the watchmen were told to be on watch for, we must be watchful against ourselves, and that is this, losing perspective. And saints, in order for us to be biblically watchful, to be on guard against the weakness of our flesh, we must keep a proper perspective and guard against its loss. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And I know we tell ourselves we know it, but we've got to live as if it is true and make choices and behave as if it is true. Paul said, this I say then, walk in the Spirit 
and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, these are the two perspectives that I, I mentioned to you. Either a focus on things of the flesh, or a focus, a life in the flesh, or life in the spirit, things of the spirit. This is perspective. And the reason is given to us. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, that is, desiring, drawing, wanting, pulling in a different direction, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. They're going in opposite directions. They're two different perspectives. They're contrary the one to the other so to, that she cannot do the things that she would. Now at this point, some take this to be their doctrine. They take this to be Bible doctrine and they say, see there, we cannot do the things that we want. And they go back to Romans chapter 7. They say, Paul even talks about it. The things I want to do, I, I don't do. I can't do. I won't do. And the things that I don't want to do and the things I shouldn't do, those are the things that I'll ultimately end up doing. And this is given to the church as the Christian life. Saint, what a lie. What a lie. It is one of the obstacles that is standing nearby of the straight way, which some are prone to run their ship of faith aground on if they're not careful. And they end up living a life, if not a life of, of lack of victory, a life of sin, thinking that they have and are living a life of faith. But it says right there in the Bible, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That verse 16 in Galatians 5, saints, that is a rock-solid promise. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We'll keep a proper perspective. The flesh is weak. If you've had any kind of a disagreement with your flesh in following Christ, if you've ever engaged your flesh in any kind of a struggle like that to do something spiritually, you encounter sometimes a strong foe. And sometimes you've been whipped. And you found yourself not laying hold of the thing that in your heart you felt you were ready for, the thing that you wanted. Is this your lot in life then? Is this what it means when the Bible says the flesh is weak? But the point to us is this, in talking about the weakness of our flesh. In living spiritually, in growing spiritually, in standing spiritually, the flesh is of no help to us. Do not look to our flesh to accomplish those things. We have it for existence. We have our flesh, and we're going to have it, but it is only for existence in this world. When we go into the world to come, the world that truly is eternal, and this world passes away, there will be no flesh there. Flesh has no purpose there. We will not tire. And so we won't need to suspend our state of consciousness in order to allow a re-strengthening of the body. There's no place for flesh in the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But we have it here. Man, we've got it here. We have it for existence in this world. What Jesus is telling us in being watchful is we must be careful that we do not live by it according to its dictates. We must see to it that our flesh is captive and obedient to Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. God has made it possible, as we're going to see here, but it is our responsibility to make it real in our life. And so God helps us in our watchfulness. On this final point, I, I want to point out to you three aspects of it. The Spirit's part, Christ's part, our part. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, we see the Spirit's part. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. That is, the weaknesses that are ours in this life. Not our iniquities, but our infirmities. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And so the Spirit is helping our infirmities. The Spirit is making intercession for us to God and before God. And here's one of the areas that we need to draw back a bit from the charismania where this, this uh, uh, praying in the spirit or this groaning in the spirit has to do with just praying in, in, in an unintelligible, what we call a prayer language. Babbling in prayer. It has absolutely no reference to that. Well, because the truth is that unless you do that, then you're not getting the Spirit's help in prayer. But you are. Every saint can have the Spirit's help in prayer. What the scripture is saying is, whether you're elegant and eloquent in prayer, whether you're long or short in prayer. And Jesus tells us it's not that you pray long, 
It's not that you pray with all the flowery and the beautiful and the right words, but it's that you pray to the point, that you pray to things that matter. And with our finite understanding and our finite knowledge, we don't know in every situation the full measure of what we ought to ask and what we ought to pray for. Even sometimes what the real problem is. And you could be praying all day. You can pray all day long without ceasing. These things can be burdens on your heart and you can be lifting them up to God. We find ourselves doing that particularly with our children. And we're thinking about it and we're, we're having a, a, a conversation with God about it. We're speaking to them about our son or daughter and sometimes all we can do is go, oh. And that's a groaning that cannot be uttered. And in that groaning, the Spirit of God says so much. He takes the things in our mind and our heart that we can't put words to, and it's as if we spoke them to the Lord. Amen. The groanings that cannot be uttered. And so we have the Spirit's help in prayer. We need the Spirit's help because it's too easy to think of a loved one who's not living for Jesus, who's not serving Jesus, as already in hell. And we get discouraged and we can despair. I told Brother Calvin the other night, well, man, you might as well just go ahead and have the funeral then. But as long as you're praying and as long as they're breathing, there's hope. But that gives hope to prayer, even though there may be grief and sadness in the flesh. But there's hope in prayer, and there's the Spirit's help in, in that kind of prayer. The Holy Spirit helps us to be watchful even in prayer. And we find ourselves then praying for the things that we ought. There are times when you're having prayer before the Lord, it'll just come into your mind, in your heart, you go, you know, what am I even talking to God about this for? This is so unnecessary. Lord, I'm sorry I even mentioned it. Let's talk about some serious things. Help here means to work with, assist. It doesn't mean he does all the work and we do not. It means to help, to assist, and to work with. Jesus has laid some of this upon us, that part that we must do. We see Christ's part just a little later on in Romans chapter 8, verses 34 through 39. Paul said, It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He spoke about the Spirit making intercession here just verses before. Now he said the Son, seated at the right hand of God, he also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that is a fantastic portion of Scripture, isn't it? That's a fantastic promise, isn't it? Every saint of God ought to be standing upon that and taking rest and comfort and strength from that. But one thing we ought not to be taking from that portion of Scripture is the attitude that Peter showed in the garden where he goes, Oh, well, if it's that, if it's that way, I don't have to be worried. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to be concerned. Oh, wake me when it's over. And yet there are those in the church today who have just that attitude. I don't have to be watchful. I don't have to be mindful about where my life is going. I don't have to be mindful about the things I'm doing, what's coming into my life from the world, what I'm losing spiritually, what's going out of my life spiritually. I don't have to worry about those things because nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! And yet turn to Jude. This is our part. The Spirit intercedes and helps our infirmities. Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, intercedes for us. As he told Peter, I've prayed for you. But then he tells Peter, you watch and pray yourself, lest you enter into temptation. Because this help does not help us unless we do our part. In Jude chapter 1, verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Do you do that? Do you build yourself up on your most holy faith? Do you do things to strengthen your faith, to strengthen your spiritual walk, to strengthen your spiritual man? What are you doing to build yourself up on your most holy faith? Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now the Bible says nothing, angels, principalities, powers, present, to come, height, depth, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's true. 
But Jude adds this, keep yourselves in the love of God. It's true, nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's true, nothing can touch us in the love of God. And so we're told only in Jude to keep ourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 24 of Jude, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. That's true, God is able. But Jude says we must keep ourselves in the love of God. God loves the world, does he not? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And yet, is all the world in that love? No. Most of the world is outside the love of God and will find themselves in hell, though he loves the world. And we're told to keep ourselves in the love of God. There are certain earmarks in the Christian's life that we're, that we're told very clearly in the Bible indicate whether or not we love God. There are things to look at in our heart and in our life. I want to dip back into the Old Testament just once here before I close into Proverbs 4.23 where we're told to keep our hearts with all diligence. That's a watchful word. For out of it are the issues of life. And so we're to keep ourselves in the love of God. We're to guard our affections on things in heaven and things spiritual as opposed to things on the earth. Now, there are things on the earth here that we have, we have a good affection toward, we have a desire for. People say, oh, I just love you know, wakeboarding. I just love snowmobiling. Well, that's okay. You can love that. You can love flying. You can love fishing. You can love carpentry. You can love your wife. But just see that you love God first. See that you love God most. See that we love things in heaven more than the things on the earth. You see, that's keeping proper perspective. That is walking according to the Spirit rather than according to the flesh. And when we walk that way, the Bible tells us we, we won't be prey to those things in the world, many multitude things of the world, and they're growing every day, that are seeking to snatch our affections away and to draw us away after them, to get us to live for them and according to them rather than for God and according to God. Saints, evaluate regularly the things you're hearing from the world, what you're partaking of in the world. What are those things saying about God? What are they saying about virtue and morality? What are those things saying and singing about and telling about the things that God says are right and true and holy and pure, things to be upheld and strengthened and kept? Do the things we're taking and hearing from the world, listening to from the world, watching from the world, do they tear away at those things? Do they slowly erode them? We're told to be watchful in that area because if we watch that, if we listen to that, and if we subject ourselves to that long enough, we will be weakened. Guard our heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. Look to our human affections. The love and the concern and the care we have one toward another. Is there an affection we have? A love of a relationship that in order to have it, we cannot have a relationship with Christ? You know, there are people that will stay out of the kingdom of God. They'll say, you know, if in order to come to Christ, I must quit living with this person, then I won't come. Can you believe somebody making a choice like that? And yet they'll make it. Because their affection is on fleshly things and not on spirit things. Saints, how are your affections set? On what are they fixed? Be a good porter yourself in your own life. Oh, God has appointed others to help watch. It says to rule in the church. But as Paul said, we're not lords of your faith, we're helpers of your joy. And so Paul writes in Hebrews, obey those that have the rule over you, for they watch for your soul. God has appointed those in the church, but we have to be watchful ourselves, amen? We have to watch our own heart, our own life. There's only so much you can do for another. We have to be watchful ourselves. And so watch your heart. See not only what is coming in. Be aware and attentive to not only what's coming in from the world, but are you losing anything from God in your life? Has anything gone out of your walk with God that's not come back? This is something to be watchful of as well. Out of it are the issues of life. The Bible says, take heed to ourselves. We're going to close with Luke 21. We opened with Mark 13 in this series of messages. Jesus addresses the same uh, thing in, in Luke's gospel, Luke 21, because it brings it home to us uh, again in our day in, in I think, a, a bit stronger way. Verses 33 through 36. Jesus said the same thing. Heaven and earth shall pass away, 
but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. That means you take care, surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life mean that we're just too caught up and too living in the world, life in this world, and doing too little to live life in the spirit, to live life in the kingdom. Do you take some of the word every day? you pray? Try to pray every day? To try to do those spiritual things every day? To keep spiritual life strong, spiritual life foremost in us? We're told to take heed, lest at any time our hearts be overcharged with surfacing and drunkenness, and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare, it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. It will come to pass. Watch ye, therefore, and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The time is going to come upon all those on the whole earth, the Bible says. And if we saints are allowed during that time, when that hour, when that day comes, as it will come as a snare upon all them that dwell on the face of the earth, the Bible tells us here that if we're watchful and if we're prayerful, that we will be accounted worthy to stand in that day. And that day of temptation to us will not be a day of falling. It will be a day of standing. Snooze buttons are pretty common now on our alarm clocks, are they not? I won't ask if you use yours regularly or if you get up the first time it goes off. But this is not an area of our life, spiritually, to rely on snooze buttons. When God speaks to us about something, as the day grows nearer, we're encouraged to not forsake the gathering, the assembling of ourselves together, and much more as we see the day approaching, making sure that we're in church to hear the preaching, to hear the teaching, because we need it. Because it's necessary for us to be strong those moments and those hours when we're out of church. But also Christian fellowship. It's another area to look for watchfulness. Do we enjoy fellowship with the world and the worldly more than we do with the saints and the saintly? God and the godly? Be watchful. It's not the time to roll over, saints, when God speaks to us about something like this and just hit the snooze button and go, oh, Lord, just a few more years, please. Just a few more years. Then I'll get up. Then I'll do it. Then I'll get busy. But just a few more years. I handed out those tracks, the dangers of drifting. And if after a message like this, if I had to said anything, if you just, if I gave it to you and you just set it there and left it, or you took it home, threw it up on a shelf, never read it, and that's hitting the snooze button. Because the things we do here, I try to see in the Lord that they're not pointless, that there's a purpose, a reason for them. And our part then is to take them seriously when God brings them into our life. To do otherwise is to hit the snooze button. And so it's left to each of us individually today. Not so-and-so up the street, not the other church down the road, not your brother next to you or your sister, but you and me. Watch and pray, Jesus said. Be watchful. Let's stand. Lord Jesus, we, we do want to hold this word in faith and not in fear. Lord, we want to be holding a right understanding of your love and keeping ourselves in that love properly because a right understanding of that love, a proper standing in that love, Lord, uh, drives out all fear. Lord, you didn't speak to Peter that night to make him fearful, but to help him to stand, to be strong in faith. And so we receive this message just that way today, that it is in your heart as you intercede for us. It is the work of the Spirit as he helps our infirmities to point us to faith and to turn us away from fear. Fear will come upon those who are in the world and of the world, Lord, and who are deceived by the world. But that's not to be so with us. Help us, Lord, to be watchful. You have done so much, and it is all by grace. And it is all your grace, all the help that you have given to men to get saved, to be saved, to stay saved. Lord, this is all your grace, and that grace will see us safely home as we sing about. Help us, God, to be watchful and prayerful about the things of God that may be slipping away from our heart and our life. And help us, Lord, to lay fast hold on them and to draw them near to us and hold them close to us again. 
lest we let them slip away. I pray, Lord, that this message would make us strong saints, watchful saints, that we might not only bless ourselves in you, but that we might be in a position to do good to our brother and to our sister. Well, God bless this word to us, that we might be a blessing to others, to the kingdom, to our homes and our families. Lord Jesus, I pray that there not be a soul here today that would take your admonishment to watchfulness and just roll over and go back to sleep. As we give ourselves to it and to you, in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 Hallelujah.